So, first of all, I'm going to introduce uh, Jerry Kerr, uh, who will be talking about the lay of the land. Jerry has volunteered at Las Colas Dreamless for four years, including being the senior miller of the big mill. He did medical research at John Hopkins and education work at the Maxwell Museum of Anthropology. Test sets him out to close I don't use microphones very often. Well, it's an honor to be here in front of a crowd like this, and so I'll try and make it quick because I know the real meat of the afternoon is going to be people telling their stories about Canyon Road and being in the area. So, the lay of the land. I think everybody knows the Santa Fe River is the primary point here in Long Canyon Road. It comes down from the Santa Fe Lake at 12,400 and has a 46 mile journey to the Rio Grande going through Santa Fe, going through Agua Fria, down La Bajada, and meeting the Rio Grande near Cochi Pueblo. Back in the day, before the, uh, the Spanish came along, the Native Americans walked along the trails, along the river, into the high country, sometimes maybe going to Pecos for trade marts, where the, the Pecos Indians would host fairs that the Plains Indians, the Mountain Indians, and the Pueblo Indians would attend in order to trade things. They also probably went up in the mountains to get wood, just like the Spanish did after that, and I assume they probably knew what pinons were all about as well. Once the Spanish came, they recognized the value of the river for the lifeblood for their own community. They formed the Osequia Madre so that they could have crops. At one point, there was 1,200 acres of crops along the Canyon Road, or the, the Canyon Road, and the river. Um, the Spanish understood that the land was the most important thing in their life at that time. Farming communities worked their way up from Barrio and Alco all the way up into the lower parts of the canyon. <sighs> okay. Uh, I'm going to read a couple of things because I, I kind of lost my place. But the folks were quick to recognize that, that farming was going to be very important for the community. Um, and the community that grew up around the upper section of Canyon, canyon Road was very much a rural community. So I just want to read something from a, an article that was written about a gentleman, Matias Rivera, who was born in 1930 in the Upper Canyon Road area. When Matias Rivera was born in 1930, the Upper Canyon Road area was not so much a neighborhood as it was the remote edge of Santa Fe. The community as such was a farming community. Cows, horses, goats, chickens, roosters, and pigs all shared the land, filling the air with the sounds of the country. Plots in the fields with beans, wheat, sweet corn, squash, alfalfa, and more led a lush glow to the lower Santa Fe Canyon. Fruit trees dotted the landscape. The Santa Fe River, which ran much deeper and faster than today, was nearly at its doorstep. Matias would walk the dirt lane that was upper and lower Canyon Road into, into town for the three miles it took to reach St. Francis Cathedral School. Later, that trek would continue as he attended St. Michael's High School and graduated in 1948. The family for years attended services at the Cathedral of St. Francis before the completion of Christopher Ray in the late 30s. So, what's happened over time is that historians have watched layers and layers of civilization being laid down over what was Canyon Road, and it says paving it with all those, all those uh, contributions from civilization. Um, the early 1920s brought a big change to Santa Fe. During and after World War I, we started seeing an influx of artists, architects, scholars, archaeologists, and people like that who had a major impact on Santa Fe. Um, the Cinco Pintores and the other folks who came along not only liked the charming atmosphere that they found in Santa Fe, but they worked hard to maintain that same amount of charm. Uh, we find that people like Oliver Lafarge wrote, wrote the uh, historic codes the architectural codes, and they were supported by John Gaumin, the historic style ordinance, sorry. And the Canyon Road Residential Arts and Crafts District allowed the artists to sell from their homes, a practice which I expect, even though that didn't happen until like the 60s, it was probably something that think Cinco Pintores and plenty of other people were already doing, it just kind of made it official. Um, the war years of the 1940s brought the first really big changes the Santa Fe outside of the art community. The Manhattan Project in, in Los Alamos brought in a different kind of scholar, the scientific scholars and things like that. Santa Fe's population went from about 11,000 in 1930 
to almost 29,000 in 1950. So there were big changes along. The word was out at that point after the war, and people started migrating towards Santa Fe. Uh, but in the end, it's always been about the land and the people. Even the people that came here were changed, I believe, by the land. The painters like Randall Davies and Gerald Cassidy, people like Gustav Bauman with his wood prints and his marionettes, they came and they focused on the people and the land in this area. They didn't paint classic art. They painted the people of the land, they painted the, the, the land itself. Um, and what they did with a, a great amount of dexterity and sensitivity was portraying ordinary people, often making ordinary people into extraordinary people because they could recognize the contributions that they made to society and to the community in Santa Fe. And that kind of is where I would just like to end it right now because we as a group here in Vosis are continuing that same tradition of honoring the extraordinary, ordinary people that live in Santa Fe. People like Vosis and even people like the Los Golondrinas who celebrates the ordinary person and finds that it's not just a life of dignity but a life of beauty. So with that, we'll let you listen to some stories. <laughs>